The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And thanks for joining us in our weekly Webinar Wednesday series as we go sequ sequentially through the DFARS, which is the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. Uh, all of our webinars are recorded and, uh, and available on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, a quick blurb about us, we provide professional services for uh, federal contractors. This is product, service, and software companies. Uh, our main offering is GSA Schedule Services, although we do provide uh, market analysis reports um, to help fuel your pipeline, assistance with pricing, and then post-award contract compliance and administration. Uh, a little bit about our webinar series uh, for the DFARS. It is complimentary. They're every Wednesday at 12 o'clock, and I think we're uh, about 90% of the way through the series. Uh, as I mentioned, they're all recorded and posted on our website as well as the YouTube channel. If you're looking just for the PowerPoint, you can go over to slideshare.net, which is a, a free site, and you can download the PowerPoint there. Uh, our speakers are primarily attorneys. We've got some subject matter experts as well. Uh, and today we're lucky to have um, uh, Alex Gorlick, who will be covering uh, our segment today. But first, we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, first up is the Virginia PTAC, which is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They are based out of George Mason University, and they cover the entire state of Virginia. Uh, they offer free counseling, mentoring, and training classes. Um, you can go to their website to look at their training calendar uh, or sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling or mentoring. Uh, they are funded through DLA, and I believe uh, they also get some grant money from the SBA. Uh, we also want to thank C3 Integrated Solutions. They are your go-to for CMMC certification, uh, as well as DFARS and NIST 800-171 compliance. If you're trying to reach uh, C3, you can contact them with the information in your lower uh, right-hand corner, which is info at c3isit.com, or you can call the phone number that's listed there as well. Uh, we also want to thank WorkPlan. They are a modern ERP for government contractors, providing uh, software-based tools for project management, as well as project and cost accounting and capture management. Um, don't think we have contact information on this slide, but uh, we will get that for you guys. Or you can go to their website, which is uh, workplan.com. We also want to thank our friends over at the Federal Business Council. They're uh, a great uh, source of events for the government contracting community, um, both virtual and in person. Um, they ha always have the annual Government Contractors Conference in April over at the Convention Center. So check their website for a list of their events, again, virtual and in person. Gov White Papers, uh, which uh, sprung out of Gov Events, um, provides an online platform for uh, posting your white papers related to government contracting and government. Uh, their website is govwhitepapers.com. And QuickTech, uh, also a CMMC uh, service provider. Uh, their contact information there is in your top right-hand corner. Uh, and feel free to contact them for uh, any of your CMMC needs. Ocean 5, uh, they are uh, also a sponsor. We want to thank them. They provide uh, anything from websites for government contractors to messaging and content. Uh, your contact there is Chris Brinker. Her uh, email address is listed there in the right corner, as well as a link to their website. And okay, now, Alex, uh, over to you. We want to thank you for taking the time to prepare a presentation today on the DFARS um, and appreciate the time that you're going to take today to kind of run through it. Uh, I'll let you say anything here and then just let me know when you're ready to advance the slide. Sounds good. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Alexander Gorlick. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Smith, Kerr & Hancock, um, where we represent uh, government contractors, both large and small, and protest claims and um, general compliance matters that occur in the sector. Um, I started out in the government contracting world as a contract specialist and eventually a contracting officer for the Navy uh, about 10 years ago. So um, this has been subject uh, close to my heart for a long time, the DFARS, uh, and I'm happy 
uh, to be here today to talk a little bit about um, DFARS part 247. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, as you guys know, um, uh, you know, the DFARS is full of um, lots of exciting and uh, uh, detailed sections on various aspects of federal procurement. Um, hopefully, um, after your presentation, after this presentation today, um, you'll be um, you'll find yourself a little bit more knowledgeable about um, the DFARS Part 247, which talks about transportation, and uh, maybe um, one that's even more exciting and current that's in other sections. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, now, DFARS uh, Part 247, uh, 247 breaks out into four major sections um, that are listed out here. Um, there's Subpart 247.1, uh, General, uh, so part 247.2, which deals with the various types of contracts for transportation or transportation-related services, things such as Steve Doring or uh, contracts for preparation of personal property for shipment, storage, or intra-city, intra-area movement. We'll also talk about subpart 247.3, which deals with transportation in supply contracts. And of course, we'll touch uh, on subpart 247.5, uh, which deals with ocean transportation requirements for US flag vessels. Um, and you may note there that uh, the DFARS actually skips 247.4 um, before it gets to 247.5. Um, the, these sections primarily relate to the different types of contracts which you may encounter um, in the world of transportation. Uh, the, uh, as you're dealing with contracts. Uh, but in order to get um, more into the specifics of the more complex trans transportation contracts, we must first understand the general basics of transportation agreements. If uh, Next slide. And that is, of course, kind of the purpose of the first subpart, uh, 247.1 general. Uh, in general, um, the world of transportation works on the basis of two methods of shipping, uh, which are most frequently referred to by the acronym FOB, uh, which you may see in some contracts that deal with uh, shipment. Uh, FOB stands for freight on board, uh, but sometimes it's more commonly referred to as free on board. And uh, the nature of the FOB marking is what actually defines what a particular shipment is going to be in term is going to result in in terms of the responsibility and the basis for payment of freight charges. So who's responsible and uh, when do they start paying for a particular shipment? And also um, the FOBs will determine uh, what is the point at which the title for the shipment passes from the seller to the buyer. So in this case, you know, government um, buying from the contractor. The way that this gets identified for you as a reviewer of the contract is by the designated physical location that um, follows the FOB marking. Um, some of the more common ones, for example, um, may refer to the marking FOB origin, uh, which means that the government pays for the cost of transporting the supplies from either the contractor's facilities or from wherever else the government accepts the supplies from the contractor. In short, the government is buying the cargo and accepting the responsibility at a particular origin. Um, this FOB arrangement essentially shifts the risks of loss uh, and damage uh, during shipment on the government because obviously the government had bought those supplies at origin. Uh, another variant uh, and commonly used term is FOB destination, which refers to the contractor paying the cost of transporting the supplies to their end destination as opposed to the government. Uh, so in short, the government actually buys the cargo and accepts responsibility for it at destination. Uh, the risks of loss and damage in this kind of arrangement um, fall on the contractor during transport. Uh, but how do you know which FOB label applies to a particular contract? If we go to the next slide, to identify the FOB, you will typically look at what is called the bill of lading for a particular shipment. Uh, but what is uh, this bill of lading? Um, if you're not familiar with the term, the bill of lading is actually literally a legal receipt that the carrier of a shipment uh, issues to a shipping party. Uh, it's the bill of lading that will typically outline the type, the quantity and the destination of the goods uh, that are being carried. 
think of it kind of like a store receipt that you you get uh, when you buy any sort of goods at the store, but uh, in the same way it applies to a shipment. And uh, all shipments must and will generally have such receipts. Uh, the DFAR section 247.1, for instance, uh, contains a particular clause that, uh, that outlines the instructions for how a contractor can request a bill of lading when the government is the one doing the shipping. Uh, specifically defines a particular form that the contractor must submit to the DOD to get such a bill of lading, which is uh, DD form 1659-1659. And it also identifies who the contractor must submit that form to. Uh, in this case, the transportation officer, if one is named in the contract schedule, or um, the contract administration office um, that will also be listed on the contract. Now, if you end up coming across these bills of lading in your function, either for the contractor or the government, it is critical that you pay attention and confirm the accuracy of any information that you see on such bills of lading. Um, that is because, you know, errors do happen. Uh, they also happen uh, when we deal with bills of lading, but, uh, you know, as with any receipt, an error on your uh, bill of lading can be very costly and expensive for either the government or the contractor, depending on the nature of the error. Uh, in other words, it can lead to the loss of money or Benjamins. And as we know, that is the last thing that you wanna be responsible for happening. If we go on to the next section, um, subpart 247.2, um, contracts for transportation or transportation related services, will actually be the section that starts getting a bit more into the specifics of the type of contracts that deal with transportation. Um, but uh, before we kind of get into the weeds on those, it is important to first understand that the focus of the subpart is not on any contracts for transportation or transportation related services uh, with the government, but only to those that occur on contractor owned vessels. Um, that is, um, the subpart does not apply to contracts that deal with operation of vessels or ships owned by or chartered um, by the government. And we'll talk a bit about chartering and what that all entails, uh, although very few agencies still actually do that in the current time. In fact, uh, this subpart's encouragement for the government to use uh, particular aspects uh, the subpart encourages the government to use particular aspects of a contractor's proposal as evaluation factors or sub factors. Makes a lot more sense when you keep that focus on contractors rather than government government owned ships in mind. Uh, specifically, the subpart suggests, but it doesn't require, uh, that the contracting officers awarding contracts that fall under this section consider you using the following aspects of a contractor's record in their evaluation. Uh, record of claims involving loss of damage and commitment of transportation assets to readiness support, uh, such as civil reserve air fleet and voluntary intermodal sea lift agreement. Now, the first aspect of, of um, a contractor that this encourages contracting officers to evaluate, their record of claims involving loss or damage is somewhat self-explanatory. Uh, the government is obviously interested in making sure that it is not spending money on a transportation contractor that frequently loses or damages the products uh, that it's transporting. Uh, the goal there is obviously to ensure quality amongst uh, the contractors uh, that it selects. Uh, but what is the second aspect of a contractor um, that, this DPAR, uh, that this DFAR section refers to? Uh, addressing the commitment of transportation assets to readiness support. Um, for example, what are the Civil Reserve Air Fleet and Voluntary Intermodal Sea Lift Agreement uh, references there? Well, I will tell you that this is probably the first time in a long time of talking about these provisions that I'm sure that at least most of you have heard about one of these, uh, the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, um, which is sometimes uh, referred to as the CRAF, C-R-A-F, um, the CRAF is what refers to a select group of aircraft from the U.S. airlines that is contractually committed into uh, this unique craft fleet uh, to help the DOD fulfill airlift requirements in emergencies. Uh, so whenever the need for airlift exceeds um, the capacity of military aircraft, there's not enough military aircraft to fulfill those functions, the DOD can pull 
on these um, civilian um, aircraft fleets. Now, over the history of the program, CRAF has only been activated three times. The third, of course, only a month or so ago to assist with evacuations of people from Afghanistan. As you may have also guessed, uh, the Voluntary Intermodal Sea Lift Agreement, just by its name, um, which is sometimes known as the VISA, and that is not a joke, that's the actual acronym uh, that they use for this program, uh, is a similar program with the maritime industry. Now, uh, the visa program thus allows the DOD to rely on commercial sea lift and equipment capabilities in the case of national emergencies or wartime operations. So very much like the craft, uh, just you know, for the oceans and for the seas. In short, uh, through these requirements, the DOD wants to incentivize certain companies volunteering for these programs um, by incorporating uh, their participation in such programs into evaluations for procurements that allow them to benefit a bit from uh, participating in these programs. If we can go to the next slide. Another focus of subpart 247.2 uh, is on Steve Doring, uh, which contrary to what the name may suggest, sadly has no relation to any Steve's, or at least the famous ones shown here, as far as I can tell. Um, actually, the term comes from the Spanish word estibador, which means one who loads the cargo. Uh, and clearly, it hasn't uh, deviated much from that original source because that's pretty much the same meaning that it holds today. Uh, the official DFARS definition for Steve Doring, and you'll see it right there, is in fact uh, loading of a cargo from an agreed point of rest on a pier. Um, or lighter in its storage aboard a vessel. So you know, moving it from the pier to the vessel. Or uh, it can be breaking out and discharging of cargo from any space in the vessel to an agreed point of rest uh, on the dockside or elsewhere. You know, a person that does such work is sometimes referred to as stevedor or more commonly uh, thought of as longshoreman or dock worker. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that the DFARS actually contains some specific requirements for the preparation of stevedoring contracts. Uh, the DFARS suggests, for example, um, that stevedoring technical provisions have to vary depending on the phase of the operations. Um, that is because the conditions uh, will vary at different ports as the DFARS recognizes, and sometimes even within the same port, it is not practical to develop standard technical provisions covering all phases of stevedoring operations. Um, the DFARS also mentions that when including rail car, truck, or intermodal equipment loading and unloading, or other dock and terminal work, under stevedoring contract, the government has to include these requirements as separate items of work. Essentially, uh, the DFARS recognizes that the work uh, may very well vary uh, in its components in a stevedoring contract. So in putting these contracts together, uh, the contracting officers must be uh, careful not to uh, set the requirements to be all the same. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll also see that there are specific rates uh, that the DFARS requires for the government to include as a minimum requirement for stevedoring contracts. Um, specifically, um, the government specifies certain tonnage or commodity rates that um, the government has to ask for from contractors um, as a minimum. So um, the rates that will apply to the bulk of the cargo uh, that is being moved on, under the stevedoring contract under normal conditions, it also um, requests uh, the, uh, the following from the contractor uh, labor hour rates that apply to services not covered by commodity rates or to work performed under hardship conditions and rates for equipment rentals. In short, uh, the DFARS wants the government to evaluate the rates uh, that the government is likely to pay for a contractor to perform these requirements. You know, both rates that the contractor is likely to face under normal conditions and uh, pass on to the government or, or rates uh, that the contractor would pay under hardship conditions or more severe conditions. If we go to the next slide, um, uh, you'll notice that subpart 247.2 also deals with uh, contracts for preparation of personal property for shipment, storage, or performance of intra-city or intra-area movement. 
Now, it is important to note uh, that while the subpart discusses these contracts as one, in reality, um, you're really talking here about a contract for preparation of personal property for any one of four distinct services. So that's you know, shipments, it's storage, it's performance of intra-city movement, but it's also performance of intra-area movement. In terms of the DFARs and the contracting requirements though, all of these contracts will typically have three main features. Um, they are the fact that these will be annual contracts generally, they will have limited areas of performance, and they will have a certain maximum requirements or minimum capabilities. If we go to the next page. Um, so what does it mean that these are annual contracts? Well, typically uh, the contracts for preparation of personal property for these purposes are to be awarded as requirements contracts uh, for services um, that are being involved. For those that have not dealt uh, with them before, uh, requirement contracts are similar, um, but also a little bit different from uh, what you may frequently see elsewhere of the IDIQ contract. Like IDIQ contracts, uh, these requirement contracts are used when the government anticipates a recurring need um, and they contain a maximum generally. But unlike IDIQs, which do not guarantee a contractor the right to fill all of the government's needs for a certain service or anything beyond a minimum really, uh, the requirements contract provides that the government will order all of its requirements for the service in the contract from the contractor for the term of the agreement. So if the government sets up such an agreement and then has no requirements for these service, it will generally not owe the contractor any orders, but in the, poss in the possible scenario where the government, let's say, sets up this agreement, then has those requirements, but purchases them from another contractor, the government could actually be found to have terminated the, the contract, uh, the requirements contract for convenience, or even breached the requirements contract uh, that it has for these services. Uh, such contracts, such requirements contracts, are thus much more certain and um, promise a lot more for the contractor um, and uh, obviously more favorable than an IDAQ contract. In the context of contracts for the preparation of personal property for these purposes, uh, the DFARs will indicate uh, that these contracts should typically be done on a calendar year basis, so you know every year uh, with option years, uh, and the DFARs even contains a unique timing requirement. Uh, specifically, you can see here it states um, that uh, such contracts should be awarded or have their options exercised before November 1st of each year if possible. So pretty close to the fiscal year be and before the holidays. Uh, now if we can go on to the next slide. Now because these agreements are requirements contracts um, which have uh, some more uh, uh, bone to them in terms of um, the government's responsibility. The DFARS requires uh, the government to take any estimate that the government makes within the contract about their intention uh, for services uh, seriously. Uh, the contracting officer must therefore uh, establish realistic quantities whenever it provides an estimate and it also must ensure that the government's minimum acceptable daily capability will at least equal the maximum authorized individual weight allowance uh, prescribed by the Joint Federal Travel Regulations, uh, which is essentially a weight of things such as baggage that one individual is allowed to ship. Uh, and two, encourage maximum participation of small business concerns as offers. And the second requirement, of course, being that the DOD does not want uh, the contracting officers to set a minimum daily requirement so large that no small business um, can easily satisfy it uh, because it requires you know, substantial capabilities that most small businesses do not have. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we'll see that under, um, that we'll touch on subpart 247.3, transportation in supplies uh, and the various uh, requirements within that subpart. Under subpart 247.3, uh, the DFAR sets out other evaluations that must be included um, rather than encouraged for use whenever dealing with contracts that contain a significant requirement for transportation of supplies outside the 
the contiguous United States. Uh, specifically, the DFAR states that for contracts that will include a significant requirement for transportation of items outside the contiguous United States, the government must include an evaluation factor or sub-factor that favors suppliers, third-party logistics providers, and integrated logistics managers that commit to using the carriers that participate in one of the readiness programs that we've uh, previously talked about, the CRAF and the visa programs. Now, uh, we've already talked a bit about the programs, but who are these third-party logistics providers and integrated logistics managers that are to benefit from using carriers in these programs? Well, uh, the answer is simple. Uh, both of these terms actually refer to simply providers of multiple logistics services, things like uh, management of the transportation, uh, demand forecasting, information management, inventory maintenance, warehousing, distribution. So essentially providers of multiple of these, uh, these kinds of um, services. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, and here we'll actually move to the, the final portion of this part of the DFARS, um, 247.5, uh, which will focus on the DOD's requirements that extend not to contracts for a particular type of service, but rather to contracts where a particular method of transportation occurs, uh, that is, the transportation by ocean. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, it is important to mention that the DFARS requirements in this subpart do not apply to all cases where the DOD moves things by the ocean. Uh, they don't apply, for example, to such big categories of contracts uh, as those that deal with transporting products obtained for contributions to foreign assistance programs or products owned by the agencies other than the DOD, unless the products are clearly identifiable, un identifiable for eventual use by the DOD. Now, keep in mind that uh, while the, uh, there is no reference here to what the definition of products is, uh, there is one in the FAR section 2.101, uh, the definition section, which basically um, comments that the, the definition of product is very similar to, to goods and supplies. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, we'll see that in cases that aren't uh, these dealing with these foreign assistance programs or um, products that are owned by other agencies, so in most other cases, um, excluding those for direct purchases of ocean transportation services, the DOD actually requires uh, that all DOD contractors transport supplies using U.S. flag vessels, unless there's a particular exception that applies and a waiver is approved by the DOD. And, and the waiver kind of process is described uh, there in that in that clause 252, 247, 1723, which comes with particular timing requirements. Uh, the exceptions allowed include the following, uh, you know, situations where the U.S. flag vessels are not available, uh, or uh, let's say the proposed charges to the government are higher than charges to uh, private parties for the transportation of similar goods, or um, let's say the proposed freight charges are just excessive or unreasonable. So why does the DOD uh, request this within the DFARS? Well, it, it's actually pretty common for ocean transportation providers in other uh, areas, um, in other instances and industries to register their ships elsewhere, if they're, even if they're focused on the U.S. market uh, primarily. As an example, many of the biggest brands of cruise lines that you can think of are actually famous for doing that. Um, you can see here on the, on the chart, a large number of cruise ships are actually registered, uh, even from some of the big brands, are registered to such nations as Panama, the Bahamas, Bermuda, or Malta. And this is common with other ocean transportation providers as well. Uh, the reason is because companies are frequently trying to take advantage of favorable regulatory environments elsewhere uh, that it may impact their employment obligations, their taxes, and other requirements. The idea, of course, the DOD, of course, is therefore concerned about paying contractors who take such measures um, for their support, uh, which is why we have this rule. If we go to the next slide. Um, contractors need to make sure that they take these requirements very seriously. Uh, in fact, even though there is an exception process uh, that I've alluded to, 
Contractors uh, need to recognize that they may not always be able to obtain the government's approval to rely on those exceptions and are the ones at risk if they don't uh, potentially enter their contract. Uh, a recent decision from the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals, um, which is one of the forums that reviews contractors' claims against the DOD, confirms as much in this uh, AC versus Arch Irodon decision. Uh, the, the board actually held that the contracting officers failed to grant an exception in time for shippers required sailing date was not a compensable delay for the contract. Essentially, the contractor was on the hook and had to address that delay in other ways. Uh, in that decision, the board actually also addressed whether the government uh, was entitled to receive a deduction of the contract value that the contractor, uh, the contractor received because they used this sort of cheaper, non-US-based um, shipper. Uh, and ultimately, the, the board affirmed that, they, that the government was entitled to that deduction. Now, keep in mind that with this clause in there, um, you know, violations and non-use of U.S. Um, US flag-owned vessels could very well end up in worse measures from the government as well, um, beyond simply a deductive change order. Now, in addition, depending on the nature of the contractor's work for the Department of Defense, contractors may also simply not be able to obtain an exception to these requirements based on the security classifications of, the, of their work. Uh, higher security classifications may just simply not be allowed uh, to obtain uh, such waivers. If we go to the next slide. Uh, the DFARS also contains other requirements of this sort for ocean transportation. Um, when the DOD charters a ship from a contractor as opposed to uh, actually contracting for it, uh, and, and chartering a ship is essentially renting out a ship from a contractor rather than hiring a contractor to perform a particular service with their ship. Um, but, but in those chartering situations, the DFARS requires that any reflagging or repair work performed in the United States it is performed in the United States or its outlying areas if the work is one that occurs on a vessel that the contractor proposed uh, to the DOD or if the work occurs prior to the acceptance of the ship by the government for their charter agreement. Um, so essentially in, in most cases um, that, that the government would be dealing with such ships under a charter agreement. Reflagging, by the way, is exactly what it sounds like. It's it's changing the national registration of the ship, or as the DFARS puts it, any work uh, to enable the vessel to meet applicable standards to become a vessel of the United States, uh, so a fancier way of reflagging, or to convert the vessel to a more useful military configuration. Now, the DOD can waive the requirement for this work to occur in the US or its territories if it's critical to national security. But of course, such waivers are rare. Um, one should never um, count on those as their first uh, step. Um, in any case, uh, under this requirement, there are other obligations for the DOD. If we go to the next slide. Uh, for instance, uh, the DOD requires that when obtaining uh, such services, um, so, so chartering agreements, uh, the contracting officer must consider the extent to which offers have had overhaul, repair, and maintenance work for covered vessels performed in the shipyards located in the United States or Guam. Obviously, you know, performing uh, such work elsewhere uh, will generally be viewed as unfavorable. Uh, the DOD must also submit an annual report to the Congressional Defense Committees, which addresses the information provided by offers with regard to their overhaul, repair, and maintenance of covered vessels. So any contractors making an offer of such agreements uh, will likely improve their own chances for obtaining an award uh, by not having such work done outside of the U.S. or its outlying areas. Um, in the next slide, finally, uh, the DFARS Part 247 also includes some requirements which apply to both charter agreements, so those rentals that we just talked about, and contracts for transportation of cargo. Uh, 
uh, that apply to what are called writing gang members. As you may have guessed, of course, uh, these are not the typical gang members that we think of when we hear that term, but perhaps uh, individuals are equally as concerning for the Department of Defense. Uh, the term writing gang members here actually refers to the individuals who are on the ship, uh, but are not part of the merchant crew. They don't perform any crew functions or cargo handling functions, and they're not citizens of residence, citizens or residents of a country designated by the U.S. as a sponsor of terrorism or any other country that the DOD determines to be a security threat to the United States. Essentially, these are uh, individuals who just happen to be on the boat doing potentially some other functions, um, but they're not part of the crew, nor are they um, part of the concerning nations. For writing gang members of the sort, uh, the DFARS requires the DOD to obtain identification um, from these individuals and also verify their backgrounds. In short, um, all of these requirements for ocean transportation sum up to one general goal uh, of the DOD, which is an intent to make sure that any boats for trans that are transporting uh, Department of Defense cargo are primarily run and handled under United States law and by uh, personnel authorized uh, by the United States. And that's uh, kind of um, most of DFARS part 247, if we go to the next slide. Uh, and that's all I really have. And I hope that this section helps you feel smarter about the DOD's requirements for transportation contracts. Thanks, Jennifer. Sure. Alex, this was great information. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing your time, your expertise, and putting together uh, everything kind of behind the scenes as far as the content for the slides. Uh, today's session has been recorded, as they all uh, are, and you'll find the recording on our YouTube channel and on our website, usually within about uh, 24, sometimes 48 hours. If you have questions about the DFARS uh, or specific topic uh, that Alex covered today, you've got his contact information here, his email and phone number. Um, and again, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, next week, we will continue on with uh, additional sections of the DFARS and we'll uh, cover this until we close out the year to the, the last part, which I believe is part 253 on the forms. Um, thanks again, everyone. And this concludes our presentation today.